movement who, who uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, I remember visiting Mrs. Hamer at her home in Ruleville, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And Mrs. Hamer lived in a simple house with a front porch. And I sat out there with her on her front porch on a dusty road down in Ruleville and listened and talked with Miss Hamer. I've seen and heard Miss Hamer sing and talk about mm-hmm. the sacrifices she made in the struggle. Where are these people today who seriously, who are willing to take the beatings, who are willing to lose the jobs, the students who are willing to be expelled from the colleges, the black leaders who are not in it because they can help their own little business interests, and that's what happens with too many of our blacks in public office. They got side businesses, side ventures as to how they survive, and they use the political clout to help them in consulting businesses or in insurance or in real estate, Mm -hmm. or first one thing and another. And the black professionals who have the independence to be able to support themselves without having to have these handouts, the doctors, the lawyers, who were willing to be leaders, the business people, they don't go into politics very much anymore because it's not economically fruitful for them. They have to make sacrifices to do that. And there's not that sense of sacrifice. So we don't have Ron, for example, today. A Mm -hmm. single black lawyer in the legislature of Tennessee where our black laws are being made. We don't have a single black lawyer in our Memphis City Council or in our Shelby County Commission. Not one. And yet these are the bodies where the important laws and legislation, and it's not that because I'm a lawyer I have this sense of of, of, uh, uh, superiority about the talent of lawyers, Mm -hmm. but lawyers do have something to bring to the table in terms of understanding the strategy of fighting in the legislative process. The chairman of the House Judiciary Committee in Nashville, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary in Nashville, these are lawyers that get these positions. Many of the people who serve on these lawmaking committees are lawyers. And so, for example, here in Memphis, when there came a vacancy with the death of State Representative uh, Turner, Larry Turner, Mm -hmm. and his wife, Johnny Turner, a lady who I like, who's a very kind lady, who's a very honest lady, but who uh, there was an alternative candidate, a young black lawyer who was willing to make the sacrifice, put himself forward, but the black people down there at the Shelby County Commission, most of them voted to put Miss Turner in. Now, as I said, it's not that I have anything against Miss Turner, but it's rare to have a black lawyer who's willing to get on the highway, travel 200 miles back and forth up there, because that takes away from their law practice. And right. if you get one, we ought to be shouting hallelujah and backing them rather than having the same old, same old going up and down the highway and not having an impact on the important critical issues in Nashville that affect our destiny. You know, Joe Bailey, you had some excellent points. I think the problem is, like, the way you came about, it was an evolutionary process. And you look at the people that you learn at the feet of, basically. I mean, you learn at the people like Malcolm and Fannie Lou Hamer, who are now giants, you know, in black leadership. So there's a vacuum with a lack of people mentoring, uh, like that young lawyer who threw his head in the ring. It should be applauded, but it is a lack of, of mentoring. Uh, of, of youth because I know I work with the school system and I can tell you a recent story where they were doing a pre-reading test at this high school which has you know, been taken over by the state and the, the kids could not read or write their juniors and seniors could not read or write at their official levels and the instructor told them basically to just to copy the instructions on the pamphlet on the packet and just make sure you put it in five paragraphs with five sentences each and this is what's going on with our black youth. Like they got this free, like you said, they have the, the, the potential, they, they, but they're not politicized. They're not mentally engaged in anything. There's nothing asked of them to do with anything. There's no sacrifice being asked of them to make. And they don't well, know I the history. I think that our young people in the colleges particularly run. I've, mm-hmm. I've spoken since the book came out uh, at Southern University uh, in Baton Rouge, where uh, much of the book is centered in the student protest there. I was on the campus of Florida a m University. I've been at Russ College, at Lane College, uh, at Harvard University, at uh, um, uh, Clark University in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just uh, uh, this day, I was at Lamont Orne College uh, for their Black History program. And so, uh, and I tell these college students 
that the education that you must get is the education, yes, in the classroom, because you must know history, you must know economics, right. you must refine the mind, you must be able to speak the English language in order to, these are all things that are strengths that you must have in combat. And very often, it is the middle class, it is the educated middle class of the oppressed people who become the vanguard of the struggle for change. And the young people, the students, are the ones who are least compromised, who are not yet into that uh, uh, mortgages and jobs that they're afraid to risk, right. but who have the opportunity as young people, students, whether they're in high school or college, to get up and stand up, take the knowledge that they learn in the books, and we need to read more, we need to learn more, and then go out and challenge authority. And the young people must understand, Rod, that you cannot and need not wait for a mass movement because mass movements do not happen in and of themselves. Right. Mass movements arise as a result of and in reaction to the display of outrage and courage and determination by a handful of people like a Rosa Parks in Montgomery or like the four black students 50 years ago mm -hmm. in Greensboro, North Carolina who went and put themselves on the line to sit at that lunch counter to challenge the entire institution of racial segregation, not just in Greensboro, but throughout the South. And so these young people must not wait until they think that there is a mass movement. They must stand up every day on the campus if they're not getting the kind of education that they ought to get, the kind of support from their teachers that they feel that they ought to have. They need to protest within the institutions, but more importantly, they must take to the streets, make themselves seen and heard. They should go to the meetings of the county commissions, go to the meetings of the city council, go to the legislature. That Those are the seats of power where they must go and become obstacles to business as usual. That's the strength that they have. And if they don't do that, then we're lost. Because it's not the middle class professional anymore mm -hmm. who's going to take the lead. They're going to follow. Even when I was in school in Louisiana as student protesters, among the student protesters, the middle class established people who were out working and making a living were not the ones who be became the leaders. They came in after and joined. They were really the ones who were criticizing the young people and saying that we were moving too fast. And they came along later. And so you can't rely on those people. All of these blacks who are working for these corporations now, now, not all, but a good number of them, they're not going to challenge those corporate. They want to get up in the corporate hierarchy so they don't give a hoot about getting involved that's going to challenge the community. And they'll give money. They'll come to the banquets uh, with the, the corporations that buy the tickets to the banquets and give them to the black employees for the NACP or for the Civil Rights Museum. But they're not going to put themselves on the line. They'll belong to little groups that are safe and harmless, that are programmed and manipulated by the black elected officials and by the corporate people. Uh, and I won't call the names of some of these little groups around here, of these up and rising young upward uh, yuppies, uh, young uh, black <laughs> kids who want to be the leader. <laughs> well, Judge Bates, I mean, he makes some great points. Well, I just think I mean, he, just, like, he just got so much wisdom. And I, I think people, I'm glad, I, you know, people can play this back. But there's so many things you dropped out that we would go off into the tangents and look at. But the thing about it, I look at the stuff that you're saying. The, you know, I, I don't work with the school system now. There are teachers within the school system that don't they don't know anything about civics. They don't know who represents them on the board of, in the board of education. They have no clue about the the infrastructure working because so this infrastructure that we all uh, survive in. Then you look at the fact that the middle class, like you said, we can't depend on the middle class, but the middle class is really evaporating, especially for a black community. Because when you live from paycheck to paycheck, if you miss one paycheck, you out in the streets or whatnot, that's not really middle class to me. So they got well, a lot you know, of gadgets. You know, what happened, too, is that uh, sometimes things have to get so bad mm -hmm. that, uh, that people will be shaken out of their complacency. Uh, and that happened in the 60s uh, with the bombing of, the, of those uh, that church uh, in Birmingham with the uh, riots that we saw mm -hmm. at the Central High School in Little Rock with the killing of Emmett Till. Uh, those outrages with the uh, riots in Watts against oppression and in Detroit.
Detroit and in Newark. Those were out, out those were outbursts of the people that came when things became unbearable. And you know, the philosopher Hegel has a concept of the dialectic in terms of social movements. That is to say that we go through cycles. And the cycle, the cyclical process is, for example, that in the 60s, which is in the Hegelian dialectic, he has three sequences. The, uh, the thesis, which is things as they are. And right mm-hmm. now, things are getting worse for us. Uh, we're worse off economically now than we were 10 years ago. Right. Um, we're, we've got high unemployment. Uh, and they say it's 20% in the black community. It's even higher than that because they're not counting the people who have gotten out of the job market completely and not even looking for jobs. The, job the ones mm-hmm. on the street. But the Hegelian process is that you take the thesis, things as they are. And people get tired of things as they are because they get worse. If you do not fight back and organize, then things are going to get worse.